a range of genres, themes, formats, thought-provoking stories, stimulating screenwriting, and mind-boggling production. The art of cinematic storytelling has evolved with every step of human evolution, shifting mindsets, impacting culture as a whole, and building trends. Films are part of our daily lives. Hello and welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. My name is Zuena Bachu and I'll be your host. In this episode, we take a look at Rwanda's own film industry. We meet some of the most loved filmmakers and entertainers of the country to find out about the challenges, gaps, and the socio-economic potential of the sector in Africa. Film production and distribution are one of the most dynamic growth sectors in the world. In Africa alone, the industry employs over 5 million people and has an estimated revenue of 5 billion US dollars. In comparison to yesteryears, when filmmaking was restricted to those with access to heavy production budgets, the digital age has narrowed the gap with the widespread availability of production technology. Disconnected. Sh scene one, shot one, take six. Action! Rwanda's creative sector is estimated to contribute up to 5% to its GDP. And while its film industry is less than two decades old, it is picking up fast thanks to rich talent pool in the nations and support from the government. The film industry, the Rwandan film industry, has gone long with 20 years before that. Even though we had movies made in Rwanda before, even before in the 80s, like, uh, uh, like the Gorillas in the Mist, that is uh, Diana Fossey, films were being made in Rwanda at that time. But there was no industry yet. So I would say the industry began in 1998. Uh, to me, that's how I can say because the first, the first film that involved Rwandans to a level of 90%, 90% or even 95%, let me say that, was in 98. That's 100 Days. 100 Days was produced by Eric Cabrera and uh, Nick Hughes is a British. And the story was about the genocide. It was, uh, you see, it was four years after the genocide against the Tutsis in 1994. So to me, that is when the industry began. Because after that, 1998, 100, uh, 100 days opened the doors now to the international productions. So in 2000, 2002 or 2003, the first uh, Rwandan films was made, 100% Rwandan. Uh, cameramen, actors, directors, producers, they were all Rwandans. So uh, then the film, the industry began. Now, if you ask me 10 years ago, I would say that 10 years ago is so close. It's really so close. Uh, I, have seen, I have seen an improvement. I've seen an improvement than 15 years ago. According to global standards, production of film and audiovisual content in Rwanda remains in a growing stage. Limited investment in the sector makes it difficult for players to access the necessary equipment, knowledge, and skills that they need to produce content. Nevertheless, practitioners estimate that about 20 production companies currently operate in Rwanda and that the industry has created 1,000 direct jobs and 6,000 indirect jobs. The Rwandan industry, film industry, is growing, but it is slowly, slowly. It's just going very slow in development, in development. One, because no resources for making films, for, to enable someone now to make a film. At first it was about skills, but now I can assure you, Rwandan filmmakers have skills now. They now have skills. 
But what they don't have is the funds. Um, so the challenges for now is uh, um, in creating um, uh, creating uh, uh, policies for for industry to protect the uh, to protect and promote and educate um, uh, the, uh, um, the to, to educate the the uh, the uh, creators and to also educate the audiences and to uh, uh, protect the works of uh, of uh, um, the uh, the producers. And to uh, um, and to create the possibilities um, uh, for uh, for heavier investment, for example, uh, for in 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 a matter of two years, I think we had um, we had a film called Petit Pays and another one called um, Notre Dame du Nil and another one called Neptune Frost that were all produced in Rwanda, but all the uh, heavy uh, grip equipment, lighting came from Kenya, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of euros. Uh, but if a, a local investor wanted to uh, buy that that kind of equipment, I mean, it would be, uh, it would, yeah, they, they would they would need a, a push for them. Uh, they would need a push, uh, a support um, from uh, the government for them to be able to invest in that kind of equipment. Personally, on my experience, my little experience I have, um, apart from the my own friends I normally had from childhood or from uh, high school. Nobody, nobody have ever fund or invest or show me any attention to to spend uh, something on 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 my my project. The most notable development in the video space has been the rise of over-the-top content consumers, making it a sustainable source of revenue and freedom to create content for Rwandan producers. A handful of Rwandan filmmakers have also accessed grants from international organizations such as the World Cinema Fund and other festivals developments. However, when it comes to the financing of creative audiovisual content, the most notable evolution in recent years has been the emergence of YouTube as a reliable source of revenue for Rwandan filmmakers. Now we have also another class of Rwandans who are really making films to throw on YouTube. He doesn't, he doesn't care whether it's good or not. But as long as it has views, it has likes, and uh, yes, he gets money out of that. Uh, by actors, I mean uh, the stakeholders have shown that they are uh, they're capable of uh, uh, of create, uh, creating um, uh, quality content with very little resources, and they've proved that there's an audience for that content. Because uh, every time, and for all these hundreds of hours of content that goes online, we see hundreds of uh, thousands of uh, of people watching them and commenting on them, engaging with this with this content. Before the pandemic. A dozen major Hollywood productions were lined up to shoot parts of their film set in Angola, Congo, Cameroon, South Sudan, and in Rwanda. Overall, practitioners estimate that on an average, about 10 local films and two foreign films are shot each year in the country, bringing in a substantial amount of foreign exchange. Most, most of them um, were heavily affected because, uh, again, we're talking about um, uh, a very irregular income, no, um, uh, no uh, uh, social security for them, no um, um, existing um, institutional uh, support to uh, uh, to uh, to contain any kind of uh, associated shocks, economic shocks uh, to the industry. So most of them um, suffered a lot, and then uh, they were organizing themselves and organizing fundraising uh, to try and support uh, um, members of that community. Um, uh, but again, there was uh, uh, this um, uh, relief uh, fund that was uh, um, that was um, created by the government to support the industry but all across the, uh, the creative sectors. Um, but the, the yeah the the, act the major actors were uh, were heavily affected during COVID. I mainly used my telephone as <laughs> as my equipment. Um, I remember, for example, uh, this one time when we were going, uh, I was supposed to go get tested for COVID and I was like one of the first people, we had no idea how that works and so I thought this would be a great opportunity. I used my telephone and I literally filmed kind of basically the process of like the 
uh, RBC, people coming to pick me ho from home and going there. Uh, of course, the testing at that time, I couldn't really film a lot. But um, yeah, I still managed to see or find a way to create content um, because of the pandemic. Rwanda's film industry has the potential to create jobs and generate capital. Whether projects are funded by foreign production companies or Rwandan filmmakers, the industry has already attracted international investment, spurred entrepreneurship and aided the growth of Rwanda's tourism sector. Players in the industry are already having conversations to hinder the gaps to boost the industry. There's incredible opportunities in the film industry because it's still very small, so it's not saturated in the way that Nairobi is or even Dar in Tanzania. There's the space to express yourself and find your own unique voice and have enough opportunities with that unique voice where you don't have to fit one kind of genre. You can be a documentary filmmaker, you can be a fiction filmmaker, you can do experimental films, you can decide that you want to go into animation. There's so many opportunities here because the industry is still very small. So we are in an, the perfect space to define what it looks like. Uh, the conversation is already there, which is very important. We've had a lot of meeting with the RIDB and the random film office is in RIDB. So there's a lot of conversation about how do we shape the random cinema. But also I'm someone who loves um, giving an example by doing like the film we just finished with Kivo it was uh, like that's that what that was the idea how do we produce a film that is 100% random with a 100% with random crew and that's also how you solidify the 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 the, the teams here because when people come to shoot in Rwanda do we need to to hire people here so who do they hire what are their, cap uh, their capacities? So if you do a film that premieres in Berlinar with a, a full cast, random cast, full random technician, a random director, random producer, it, was, it shows the potential of what we can do. But we have products that the ministry will buy. You sit with the ministry and you see, okay, yeah, we can see these filmmakers, they are talking about our nation, what they are making, what they are building up, is also good for the country. It's, it's not simply just a matter of making films. We are still very young, we are growing up. We need our stakeholders. Hollywood now, that's what I was saying, no longer needs the government. Hollywood, that's why you see that they, they, are, now out of, they are now out of cultural stories. No, they have transformers, a, a lorry turning out into a robot, a robot fighting, blah, blah, blah that kind of thing. Why? Because they know that now the government is coming for them. When they were still young, they wanted, the, they needed the government. But now that they're very strong, the government needs them. So the same thing with us. We are very young. The industry is very young. We need to entice the ministry. We need to have products that the ministry will buy. And it's not money that we need from them. We need services from them. Thank you very much for watching. If you have questions or comments, write to us on Twitter at CNBC Africa, or you can tag me directly at Zuena Bachu. See you next time.